Thank you for coming and being here. Uh, welcome, of course, to those who are on the live stream this morning. We are very pleased to have you with us. Especially in the times in which we live. I work for a company that does infrastructure for marketers. And I have heard, I think, almost every cliche that you can think of for the period of time in which we live. These trying times, these interesting times, the current troubles. You know, even in the best of times, people will approach a preacher with some problem and they will say, I have done all that I know how to do and I don't know where to turn. But we do live in very trying times, and that makes it all somehow, I think, worse. We live in the midst of a pandemic, the likes of which the world hasn't seen since just before World War I. Not World War II. Everybody thinks of World War II. This one was right before World War I. Because of that, our economy has taken a downturn. Depending on what estimate you, you look at, unemployment in our country is at near 25%. When we add on top of that civic upset and enmity between people, we see civil unrest going on around us. It shouldn't be of any shock to us that people would look and say, I've done all that I know how to do and I don't know what to do anymore. And there are many passages in the Bible that could tell someone where to turn, to whom to turn, and what they should do. But perhaps there is no greater concentration of, of those passages found in the Bible than is to be found in the book of Proverbs. And so as I was considering what I might say this morning, I came across an old lesson by Leon Odom. And if you didn't know Leon, then I, I grew up listening to him, so i got to say I feel sorry for you. His was, to my mind, especially since I grew up listening, his was the gold standard of preaching. But I came across an old lesson of his, and I... I have kind of turned it into my own, but this didn't originate with me, but I think it's still relevant to what we're going through today. The book of Proverbs gives man really real answers to any number of problems faced by any generation in time. It doesn't tell us of redemption, but it does tell us of human relationships and human life. Solomon seems to have an answer ready for anyone who ever had a problem under almost any circumstances at all. And so to the people that are looking around themselves and they're saying, I just don't know what to do. There's a passage found in Proverbs 3 beginning in verse 5, which should be familiar to many of us. I'd like for us to spend what time we have together this morning considering what Solomon tells us here. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So the first step that Solomon gives us here is to put your trust in the Lord. Now, this is the first step. This isn't some form of preacher's rhetoric or something that Christians say. There are several synonyms that we could use here for the word trust, but perhaps none are more apt than the words faith and confidence. You need to put your confidence in the Lord. He knows what's best for us. 
We live in a time in which we don't know what to do, and so we need to turn to someone who does know what to do. And what Solomon tells us is, that's the Lord. We turn to him. We turn to him in the midst of our sorrow. We turn to him in the midst of our pain. We turn to him in the midst of our joy. You know, there's a passage found in the book of Hebrews that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. All too often our problems are caused by leaving God. We've decided that we're going to get through this through our own ingenuity. We're going to get through things by solving our own problems. And, and this, is a, this is something that is in many ways not unique but special to the American people, right? Right? We all love the story of the self-made man who came to this world with two dollars in his pocket and became a millionaire. And he did it through hard work and perseverance and he did it in the words of, of Frank Sinatra, he did it his way. But especially when it comes to our souls, when we try to do it our way, that's when we find ourselves in the deepest problem. We've set aside God's way to take things that he has given us so that we might give them to another. I don't want to have to love my neighbors, so I'm going to ask my church to do that. If I have problems with someone, I'm not going to deal with that person directly. I'm going to go to the elders. We do that even in our civic life. I don't want to care for my fellow man, so I'm going to ask my government to set up a program to do it for me. We take the things that God has given us and we ask someone else to do them. If I'm going to put my trust in the Lord, what that requires is a reversal of my life. That's not to say elders don't have their place, and that's not to say that governments can't set up programs to help people. But if I'm going to put my trust in the Lord, and I want to make the life and the world around me better, I need to step up and do something for myself. I need to find that person who needs help, and I need to offer them that help. Not wait for someone else to give it to. If I see wrong or injustice being done, I need to be the one who is willing to stand up and say, that's wrong. That's unjust. Getting out of the difficulty that we find ourselves in requires that we reverse the course of our lives so that it's no longer centered upon us and our trust is placed in ourselves. It requires that we turn ourselves around and put our trust in God. The Bible describes for us two ways of going through life. One is a narrow road that leads unto life and few there be that find it. Why do you think that is? Wealth and fame? We think of those quite often, right? That's what I I would have to give up everything. We think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and asked him, What do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And we think of that fellow and we say, you know, I had to give up wealth. And for a lot of people in the world today, they don't want to give up their wealth, do they? But just as important, we also have to be willing to give up the other things that weigh us down like depression and blame. The other path is described as broad because people aren't willing to pay the price necessary to be disciples of the Lord. They have to give up the things that they want for themselves. You hear this all the time, right? I want what I want. We need to do things my way.
That's my right. Recognition from someone else, and even though we're in the midst of trouble, I personally wasn't responsible for it, and since I personally wasn't responsible, then I've got nothing to do with it. We have to give up the things that we want for ourselves. We have to lay aside the harmful things that we've taken upon ourselves. We look at the problem, we just say, that's just too big. We look at our lives, we say, I've done so much wrong. And the enormity of the problem weighs upon us to the point where we become unable to move. This happens in our homes, doesn't it? How often have you looked at your house and said, oh man, I've got so much housework to do. And you look at the amount of housework that's to be done and and it's just overwhelming and you don't know where to start. And so what you do, you continue to just stand there and look at it all and nothing continues to get done. The fact of the matter is we do that with our lives too. We see the enormity of our sin and we say, I don't know where to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. And we just sit there and we let it weigh us down and keep us from where we need to be. One of those things that the Bible demands of all men is that they put their trust and their faith in the Lord, that they stop depending on themselves. God will never leave people, but people will leave God. God's not going to turn around and walk away from you. So if you find distance between you and God, it's not God who put that distance there. So what you need to do, if you would start finding out what to do, is start by putting your trust in Him. Put your trust and your confidence in Him. That's the very first step. And then he continues on and says, with all your heart. That means that there can be neither hesitation nor reservation to what you're doing. No small section of your heart that is reserved for you and you alone. Nothing where you think you've got it figured out better than God does. Solomon is saying here that if you trust in the Lord but you don't do it with all your heart, if you do it on a trial basis, he says you haven't really trusted in the Lord. That's not real trust. Looking at the man... He says he shouldn't lean on his own understanding because he's not capable of accomplishing what he needs to accomplish. Just the mere fact that we're standing there before God and saying, I've done all that I know how to do and I don't know what to do anymore should tell us the truth of that. I can't lean on my own understanding because the fact is I already have come to the end of it. And the fact that I'm saying I don't know what to do should tell me that I've got to turn to another. If you knew what to do, you'd do it. And then he says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. You need to acknowledge God. That means he comes first over yourself, over your spouse, over your children, your family, your friends, and your political allies. We can't live our lives defending. We can't live our lives defending the indefensible. If we would know what to do, the first thing we've got to do is put our trust in the Lord, but then we've got to acknowledge God, and that means we've got to stop defending what we can't defend based upon our knowledge of what God would say. I have to acknowledge Him in all of my paths. It says, and he will direct your paths. So if you want God to direct your paths out of your troubles, 
then you've got to first meet the condition that in all your ways that you acknowledge him. And then Solomon comes to the root of the problem. Be not wise in your own eyes. This is the root of the problem that men have. We get wise in our own eyes. We start to think that we have the answer and the solution. And maybe if I do what I've done before, but I just do it in a little different way, it'll come out better this time. Or we hear what God has to say and we become like Naaman. You remember Naaman, right? Syrian general comes to Elisha because a servant girl told him, or told her, her mistress, Naaman's wife, said, if only he could go see the prophet of God there, I'm sure he could heal him. And Naaman comes and, and Elisha sends word. Elisha doesn't even come out on his own. He sends word out by his servants. says, go dip seven times in the Jordan. And Naaman's response is, that nasty old thing? I think not. And his servants finally came to him and said, if he, they demanded some great glorious thing of you, you'd have done it. And Naaman's response was, that's a dirty old river. We got two rivers running through the town where I live, and they're both cleaner than it. He was wise in his own eyes. And we hear really from him some of the most dangerous words. that can come out of man's mouth, especially religiously. He starts his statement to his servants, Behold, I thought he would come out and wave his hand. And then he utters the next most dangerous words. He says, But what about? Some of the most dangerous words that exist in religion are the words, I think, and what if, or what about. Naaman said, I thought he would come out here and wave his hands and great big to do because he knows how big and powerful I am. And if that weren't enough, he tells me to go dip in this dirty Jordan River. What if I did it at home in one of the two clean rivers there? But the fact is, we do this in more areas than just religion. This is the cause of so much of the strife that happens in our world because people start saying, I think, and what about, and what if, and all because they, they want to get around something. Because usually when we hear those words, I think, and what if, and what about, we hear those words because someone has been told something they don't like and they're trying to justify themselves. I don't think God would send someone to hell for not being baptized. What about that man who's walking down to the river to, to be immersed and a tree limb hits him in the head and kills him? What if we just sprinkled some water on someone? Oh, wouldn't that be enough? Be not wise in your own eyes. Instead, he says, fear the Lord. That demands reverential respect. This means we follow him. We follow him because we fear his consequences more than man's. Right? Doesn't the Lord say, don't fear the one who can merely kill the body, but the one who can cast both the body and the soul into hell? I 
I may lose friends. My family may hate me. My enemies may be, as the Lord once said, those of my own household. But I need to fear the Lord. If for no other reason than because I fear the consequences he can lodge against me than the consequences that come because someone doesn't love me anymore. I need to fear him. But that's reverential respect, and that also means I need to love him. Fear of the Lord is not just quaking in my boots, although it includes that. It's also love. If I love him and I try to be more like him, wouldn't that help me out with so many of the problems that I see in the world today? Because if I see the way that he loved me and I want to be more like him, then shouldn't I start to love other people the way that he loved me? Should cause me to stop looking at other people as the enemy. They're not the enemy. They might be a danger to me. But they're not my enemy. They're someone that I should love. And loving them the way that God loved me, I need to look out for what is best for that person. And when I do that, then the last part of this that Solomon has to say falls into line. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. The problem that men have with leaning on their own understanding is that they depart, just they don't depart from evil. Men prefer the lives that they live. even if the lives that they're living are the causes of their problems. Let me say that again because you didn't hear it. Men love to lead the lives that they're leading, even if those lives are the causes of their problems. Don't we? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, that describes really all of us. I don't want to give up whatever it is that I have. If you think about it, that describes that rich young ruler, doesn't it? He had many possessions and the Lord tells him, one thing you lack. You've done all, you tell me that you've done all that the law says you need to do, but there's one thing still you lack. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, And come follow me. And it says that the man departed with sadness because he had great riches. He liked the life that he was leading. And he wasn't willing to give it up. Even when the Lord said that's the one thing that stands between you and the kingdom of heaven. That's the one thing you lack. If men walk circumspectly before God, if they didn't live wicked and evil lives, then we wouldn't have the problems that we have today. And that's true on any number of fronts. So if you will, put your trust in the Lord. With all your heart. And acknowledge him in all of your ways. Not trusting in yourself. But fearing God. And departing from evil. Then you'll know what to do. When you don't know what to do. Even when it seems like the world's on fire. The next time you find yourself in a spot. 
whether that's right now or whether that's going to be this afternoon or tomorrow. Think about which one or ones of these pieces of good advice that Solomon gives us can help you to get out of it. We haven't spoken this morning about what the Bible says we need to do that, we, that one might be saved. But let me tell you, it starts in much the same way. You have to stop trusting in yourself. You have to be willing to walk away from evil ways. You have to trust in Him. You need to listen to what He says to do. You need to let Him direct your paths. If you know what He said about hearing His Word, if you've heard it, and you believe it, You haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins. You need to do that today. That's part of leaving evil ways and allowing him to direct your paths. So if you haven't done that, you need to do that today. If you have become a child of God and you've wandered astray and you need us to pray with you and for you, we'd love nothing more. But if you find yourself this morning separated from your God and you don't know what to do, That's what you got to do. If we can help you, won't you let us by coming while we stand and sing?